Hi, my name is Paul Grogan, and in this Gaming Rules video, I'm going to be teaching you how to play Downfall, designed by John D. Clare and published by Tasty Minstrel Games. Downfall is a game set in the future, after a nuclear war has devastated most of the planet. You will be waking survivors from their cryostasis bunkers, scrambling for what remains of the resources left on the planet, rebuilding your technologies, and trying to survive. Now, this video has been filmed using a prototype copy of the game, so all of the components that you see here are not final. And also, some of the names of the things that I say in the video may have been changed before the final version gets released. I'm not going to cover the full setup rules here, I am going to show you what the board will look like at the start of a three-player game, and cover some of the key concepts. Each player will start the game owning a group of four connected hexes. Some of these hexes contain more than one space. For example, this hex contains planes and an oil refinery. The artwork depicts the type of terrain in that space, and the resources that it produces. One of a player's spaces, chosen by them, is a dead zone. This space is uninhabitable for the whole game, and cannot be entered. Around the dead zone are a total of four radiation markers. These spaces are habitable, but without protection, your people will die. Apart from the dead zone, each space that can produce resources starts the game with two raw resources of the appropriate type. If you have an abandoned oil rig, you actually place two gathered resources. A gathered resource is a raw resource token flipped to the other side. Each player begins the game with one bunker, five regular survivors, three gathered food, and then a choice of four things in a combination of outposts and airships. All of these things are placed in any of the starting spaces, subject to certain restrictions, like buildings cannot be placed in water, and you cannot have two outposts in the same space. A quick side note about radiation, because it's something that you need to be aware of during the game. If at the end of any of your turns there is radiation in one of your spaces, then all of your survivors there will die unless they have protection. Equipped survivors, which are flipped over survivor counters, show the radiation icon, and you also see this icon on buildings. This is protection, and it applies to the whole space. So, as long as there is at least one of these icons in a space with one radiation, all survivors there are protected. This space has two radiation, but there are two radiation shield icons, so the regular survivors are safe. The gathered food that you start with can go in any spaces you occupy, and you can put it in storage in buildings if you want to. Next, each player has a player board, which contains most of the information that you'll need to know during the game. Of your nine technology cards, you start the game with Cellular Regeneration, which is placed here. The other technologies you can gain during the game are placed face down here. You also have a deck of 15 action cards. Now, unless you're playing with the optional leader rules, all players will start with exactly the same deck of 15 cards. Shuffle the 15 cards and place them face down here. Each player then draws the top six cards of their deck into their hand. If you draw a winter card, then advance the event marker by one space, and then discard the winter card, and draw again until you have a hand of six non-winter cards. Then, choose two of those cards in your hand, and place them face down in your reserve here. And the game is now ready to begin! The game is divided into rounds, and each round is divided into phases. In phase one, each player draws one card from their deck into their hand. In the first round of the game, you would actually skip this phase, because you already have four cards in hand, but in later rounds, you will draw another card to bring your hand up to four, and if you draw a winter card, then just like in setup, you would place it in your discard pile, advance the event marker, and then draw a replacement card. Phase two is pre-action events, and you look at the event track for any red or brown spaces that the event marker has landed on or passed over this round. These are then resolved at this time. The brown spaces indicate a random event has happened, and a card is drawn from the event deck, placed on the event space, and then resolved. Some of the events are one-offs, and others have ongoing effects. The red spaces are conflict, and I'll explain this later on. The other two spaces, spoilage and fallout, are only resolved in phase four, so I'll explain these later too. In phase three, each player simultaneously chooses one card from their hand, and places it face down on top of their discard pile. This card determines the action that you're carrying out this round. Instead of playing a card from your hand, you could play one from your reserve. 
You would want to do this, for example, if you had a card in your reserve that you knew was there and you wanted to play, and you didn't have the right one in your hand at that time. And if you do play a card from your reserve, then you must choose one card from your hand and put it into your reserve. So whatever you decide to do, you should now have three cards in hand, two in your reserve, and one face down on top of your discard pile. The three cards in your hand are passed to the player to your left, but for now, just place them on the table to your left with your passed cards marker on it. At the end of the round, the player to your left will pick them up and put them into their hand. Once all cards have been played, it's time for phase four, where the actions are resolved. Each player reveals the card they played, and then the players carry out actions based on their card. Often this can be done simultaneously, but if turn order matters, players will take turns in order of the initiative value on their cards, with the lowest number playing first and then in ascending order. After all actions have been carried out, it's time for phase five, which is where you resolve the spoilage and fallout events on the event track that I mentioned earlier. So the sequence is draw a card, then resolve the pre-action events of conflict and random events, then everyone plays a card, which is then revealed and players take actions. And then you resolve the post-action events of spoilage and fallout. The game ends when the event marker reaches the final space, and then the victory points are counted, and the player with the highest total wins the game. There are six different major actions in the game, and they are shown on the left-hand side of the cards. I'm going to summarise them here. But before I do, I'm going to briefly mention minor actions. You see, every card also has a minor action listed at the bottom, and when it's your turn to resolve your card, you can do the major action on the left or the minor action at the bottom. Minor actions are generally weaker versions of major actions, so I'm not going to cover them in detail in this video. The six major actions are summarised on your player board, so let's go through them. Action 1, Gather. With this action, you use your regular survivors to gather resources from the spaces they are in. So here I have one regular survivor and one equipped survivor, so I can gather one of these food only, because equipped survivors cannot gather resources. The gathered resource may now be placed in a storage building in the same space if I wanted to. Action 2, Regrow, Excavate. This is actually two actions, but you do both of them in order. First, Regrow. You place one raw food on each clean water or plain space that you occupy. And then, on each space where you have an outpost, you place one raw resource of the corresponding type. So here I got two raw food, one for the regrow and then another for the excavate. Action 3, Bunker. When you choose this action, for each of your bunkers you choose the following. Either place a regular survivor on the same space as the bunker, this represents that you've woken somebody up from cryosleep, or place one raw stone, metal or oil onto the space. Or gain one culture point, moving your marker up the culture track. Now instead of doing one of those three things, you could actually do all three, which is clearly the best option, right? You get a survivor, you get a resource, and you gain one culture point. Well, there are some times in the game where you might not want that additional survivor, so in this case you will either just choose to gain a resource or gain one culture point. Some spaces on the culture track give you an immediate reward, and there will be bonus points at the end of the game based on the position of the markers on this track. Action 4, Build. There's a number of different things that you can build in the game. Outposts, bunkers, airships, and you can also upgrade survivors to be equipped survivors. To do this, you must spend the resources shown on your player board. Those resources can be from any spaces you occupy or from your storage. You can build as many things as you can if you have the resources to do so. Also, when you choose the build action, you can spend two gathered oil or any three other gathered resources to remove one radiation from a space you occupy or an adjacent space. And you can repeat this as many times as you want to if you have the resources. You can reduce a radiation threat of 2 down to 1, or remove a radiation threat of 1 from the board. For each radiation you clear up, you move your marker on the environmental track forward by one space. Each space you advance gives you an immediate victory point, and there are also points at the end of the game based on the position of the markers on this track. Action 5, Command. With the command action you can do up to three things, and in any order. First, you can place a command token on any explored space. This will give you a bonus in battle, which I'll explain later on. You can also move up to two of your units. 
Survivors can walk by foot to an adjacent space, or airships can move up to two spaces. Airships can carry two survivors and one gathered resource, and in fact airships need at least one survivor in the airship because somebody's got to fly the thing. Survivors moving by foot cannot enter water spaces, nor can they move onto a dead zone. Well, technically they could move onto a dead zone, but they'll die at the end of the turn, so it's probably not a good idea. Airships, however, can fly over a dead zone. And finally, the third thing you can do is to spend any amount of gathered oil. Each one you spend allows you to place another command token or move a different unit. A quick note about exploring new hexes, as this will happen when you move your units. Simply, when you move onto a face down hex, you flip it face up and can orient it however you choose. If there was a radiation token on the hex before you flip it, then you must place that token on one of the spaces of the explored hex. Each resource producing terrain starts off with two raw resources of the appropriate type, just like in setup. And you may then choose to move onto the hex or not. If you move onto a hex containing another player's pieces, nothing immediately happens. More than one player can occupy a hex at the same time. Fighting only takes place between players if a pre-action conflict event was triggered, or somebody deliberately triggers combat by playing a war card. Action 6. Research or War The research or war action allows you to do either research or start a conflict, but not both. To do research, you choose one of your technology cards and put it into play beneath your player board, paying any cost shown on the card itself. So if I wanted to develop nanobiotics, I have to pay one metal. Technology cards give you a bonus for the entire game. In addition to researching new tech, you can also activate your existing cellular regeneration technology which you started the game with. Pay one of each of the gathered resources to gain three victory points. If instead of doing research, you choose the war effect of the card, then all conflicts that you are involved in are immediately resolved. So it's time to talk about conflicts! As mentioned earlier, conflict between players takes place in one of two circumstances. Either a pre-action conflict event has triggered, or a player plays a research war card and goes to war. I'll cover the conflict events first. When a conflict event is triggered, each space on the board is checked to see if there is a conflict. Conflict happens if two or more players occupy the same space, and both of them have at least one battle strength or survivor on the space. Battle strength is the small explosion icon found on equipped survivors, bunkers and command tokens. In this case, blue has two battle strength and pink has one. The winner is the one with the highest battle strength, and in case of a tie, nothing happens. The winner scores two victory points, but the loser still gets one victory point. The winning player may then convert any one outpost, bunker or airship involved in the battle to their own, or kill one of the losing survivors. Any remaining losing survivors in the space are moved to an adjacent space, chosen by the winning player. If there were no conflicts anywhere on the board, then there is peace, and all players gain one victory point for every two spaces they occupy. And if you occupy an odd number of spaces, then you can pay one gathered food to round up the victory point gain instead of rounding down. At the end of a conflict event, even if there was peace, all command tokens are removed from the board. If conflict is triggered due to the playing of a research war card, then only the spaces on the board that contain the pieces belonging to the player who played that card are checked to see if there is a conflict. And if that player is not involved in any conflicts, then there is no peace. The peace option only applies when a conflict event is triggered from the event track. Also, if a conflict happens due to a player playing a research war card, then the command tokens on the board are only removed from spaces where there was a conflict. The other two events on the event track are spoilage and fallout. Both of these take place only after all players have carried out their actions for the round. During spoilage, two things happen. First, all gathered resources on the board that have not been stored are removed from play. You can store a gathered resource any time during your turn by moving it into a building in the same space or onto your cyber storage of your player board. So, for example, if you knew spoilage was about to happen, you want to try to store as many gathered resources as you can. Raw resources are not affected by spoilage. After all non-stored gathered resources are destroyed, each player must now feed their survivors. 
The cost is one gathered food per survivor, but all players get three free food in the first spoilage event of the game to help them out. As the game goes on, these events provide less and less free food. And for each survivor that you cannot feed, you lose two victory points, or you could kill the survivor and lose one victory point instead. The fallout event is where radiation spreads. First, all dead zones on the board spread one radiation to all adjacent spaces. Second, any space with three or more total radiation then becomes a dead zone, and all tokens there are immediately destroyed. And finally, each space with radiation in is checked to see if any survivors there can survive the current radiation level. For example, here there is a radiation level of two, but only one protection icon. So the survivor is killed and you lose one victory point. When the event marker moves to the final space on the event track, the game is drawing to a close. After all players have taken their action for that round, there is a normal conflict event, or peace if there was no conflicts. Followed by a fallout event, and then finally a spoilage event, but this time with no free food. And then the points are added up. Each player gains two victory points for each of their remaining survivors, and then points are awarded based on the position of the markers on the culture track. In a three player game, this is six points for first and three points for second. The environmental track is scored in the same way. And at the end of the game, the player with the most victory points is declared the winner. I hope you found this video useful in learning how to play Downfall. For more of my videos, please subscribe to the channel. And for more great games from Tasty Minstrel, please visit playtmg.com. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching.